really need this microphone in a room this small, but he records it, and so you're going to have to turn it down because I don't want to be... Because <laughs> I've been known to get excited before. So, yeah, if I see any of you going like this, I've got to make it stop. That'll be, that'll be the uh, clue. I'm going to be looking with you this afternoon at a sermon that was delivered by the prophet Jeremiah, but before we turn to that, I want to remind you of something the Apostle Paul said about what we call the Old Testament. Paul said in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So we certainly are under the new covenant, but the Old Testament remains the word of God, and it speaks powerfully to us today. It just takes a bit more care and effort to hear its message correctly. Now let me set up a little bit about the sermon that we're going to be looking at in Jeremiah chapter 7. As you may recall, the, the United Kingdom of Israel divided in 931 B.C., after the death of King Solomon. Israel was the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. And in 722 or 721, the Assyrians, they completed their conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel by capturing its capital city of Samaria and exiling many of its inhabitants. And that was the end of the northern kingdom's existence. Well, King Josiah, he reigned as king over Judah, the southern kingdom, from 640 B.C. down to 609 B.C. And following his death in 609, Judah fell under Egyptian control. Pharaoh Necho, he removed Josiah's son Shalom, who had the throne named Jehoahaz. He removed him as king of Judah. And he replaced him with Eliakim, who was another of Josiah's sons, who had the throne name Jehoiakim. And Jeremiah, he was prophet, a prophet in Judah at this time. His ministry spanned the years from 627 B.C. down to about 584 B.C. And these were years of tremendous change in the ancient Near East. Now, the temple sermon in Jeremiah chapter 7, was delivered shortly after Jehoiakim had become king, had been placed on the throne by Pharaoh Necho. And that puts it about four years before the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar first came against Jerusalem and took tribute from the city in the form of people and various religious articles. You'll recall that Nebuchadnezzar, that's in 605 when Nebuchadnezzar first comes. The sermon's in 609, Jehoiakim's on the throne, Pharaoh Necho puts him there. In 605, Nebuchadnezzar first comes, the Babylonian, and he takes tribute in the form of persons, religious items. He comes back eight years later in 597, and he captures the city. He comes back ten years after that in 587, 586, and destroys the city of Jerusalem. Now, this sermon's probably delivered... It's delivered in the gate to the outer court of the temple while pilgrims are thronging to this court during one of the three annual pilgrimage feasts, whether it was tabernacles, Passover, the Feast of Weeks. And the sermon, it's summarized. So it's given in Jeremiah chapter 7, and it's summarized in Jeremiah chapter 26 by Baruch the son of Neriah, who's Jeremiah's scribe. And that's in 20, 26, 1 to 6, it's summarized. And then you get the reaction of the populace to the sermon. You get that in Jeremiah 26, 7 to 24. Now, let me read the sermon. But before I do that, is anybody here hot? I saw somebody fanning. Okay, see, I don't know if this will work. Uh, I'm not checked out on this. Do I lower it? Yeah, I'm lowering it. I'm trying. I'm trying. Well, I have it down to 60, and so if it doesn't come on, I need, I need an engineer to come work on this. <laughs> Here he comes. Here comes my man. John does it all. 
if he's not leading singing. By the way, I appreciate that song leading, always. I hear it, I hear it. Okay, now I'll be warm talking. I don't know about you guys. My wife will be happy. I know that. I, <laughs> let me read to you the temple sermon. I'm going to read it to you out of the NIV. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 to 15. This is the word, the, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder Commit adultery and perjury. Burn incense to Baal and follow follow other gods you have not known. And then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say we are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your ancestors. I will thrust them from my presence just as I did all your fellow Israelites, the people of Ephraim. Now this, I hope I don't have to say, is a call to repentance. This is a call for them to stop doing what they wanted to do and to be the kind of people that God wanted and demanded them to be. Look what God's people had sunk to. Stealing, murder, adultery, perjury, and idolatry. They had chosen to ignore, just completely blow off their covenant responsibilities. And their hearts had become so hard that it didn't even bother them. It had simply become business as usual. And despite this, they fooled themselves into believing that nothing would happen to them. They convinced themselves that nothing would happen to them because God's temple was in Jerusalem. See, they thought that God's special identification with Jerusalem, which represented his presence with the people of Judah, that that would provide some kind of automatic, or mechanical protection against any enemies. They lived in rebellion to God and thought they could count on God for protection. It's as though God's blessing or His protection, it had nothing to do with them. He would guard His turf. You see, God would guard His turf and they would be the ancillary beneficiaries of God's territoriality. That's how they looked at it. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. God's protection has nothing to do with me. That's what's behind verse 11. God is asking them, when he says, he's asking them if the temple has become a den of robbers to them. You see, meaning a hideout, a haven for robbers. A place where robbers could feel safe from the consequences of their actions. We go out here and loot and do this stuff, and then we retreat, you see, to our den, where we are safe. And this is what they're saying. My temple has become a haven 
for sinners so that they think here they are protected from the consequences of their rebellion. And isn't that how some of us treat the church? See, that's, that's the thing that we have to see. How some of us treat the church. We see it as something that provides cover or safety. However we choose to live. We can live any way we want to. And as long as we have some connection and attachment to the church, well, that provides some kind of immunity. And some kind of protection. We think that God's protection from judgment, it has nothing to do with our relationship with Him. That it has everything to do with where He placed His name rather than how we have personally responded to Him. And that's exactly the attitude that the Apostle Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 5. He says there, he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, I don't have time to develop this. But this comes in here, this chapters 8 through 10, 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians. There Paul is dealing with Corinthians with Christians there in Corinth who were pushing to eat sacrificial meat in pagan temples. This is what these chapters deal with. You had people there who were saying it's okay for us to go and participate in these idol feasts that are held in these temples, which involve them, you see, in a pagan religious rite. And Paul spends these chapters telling them, no, you can't. You cannot do that. You can't engage in that. And in chapter 10, verses 1 to 5, the verses that I just read, Paul wants to remove from them any notion that their baptism and their participation in the Lord's Supper makes them immune or invulnerable to disqualification. His point is that their participation in those sacraments will not save them if they continue attending the meals at the idol temples. That they can't look to that and say, I'm immune. No matter how I live, I've been baptized and I share in the Lord's Supper that protects me despite how I live. And Paul wants the Corinthians to know that's not the case. He doesn't want them to be ignorant of the fact that all the Israelites, all of them, who came out of Egypt, they participated in a type of baptism. And they shared in a type of Lord's Supper. Yet, most of them were struck down in the wilderness. They had a type of baptism and a type of Lord's Supper. Did that make them immune? No. Most of them died in the wilderness. Now, the ancient Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage it was finalized, as you know, by the passage through the Red Sea, a passage that began with their going under God's guiding cloud as it moved from in front of them, over them, to behind them, to separate them from the Egyptian army. You see that in Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. And Paul characterizes this water passage, the cloud over, and then we go through the water. He characterizes this water passage here, this passage of deliverance as a baptism into Moses, paralleling it to their baptism into Christ. After their baptism, all of the Israelites, all of them, shared in a type of Lord's Supper. They were sustained in the desert by food, by manna. They were sustained by drink, by the water that was supernaturally provided for them. And as you know, manna, that's the bread that God rained down, that He provided for the people of Israel during their wilderness period. 
He provided it for them during that time. You see in Exodus 16. And the drink refers to the water that's supernaturally provided for them at Meribah. You see that in Exodus 17 and in Numbers chapter 20. Now the manna and this miraculously provided water, these were spiritual in the sense that they had a special spiritual significance. They signified the spiritual reality of God's provision for His people and they served as a type or analogy of the Lord's Supper. But despite those sacred privileges in which the Israelites participated, which were similar in kind to those that the Corinthians felt, or at least were tempted to feel, made them invincible, God wasn't pleased with most of them, as evidenced by the fact that they were killed in the wilderness. You see, God wants our hearts. That's what He wants. He wants our hearts. He wants our loyalty. He wants our commitment. He wants our life. He wants a complete surrender to Him. That's what the Bible calls faith. It is, as I've said, ad nauseum, it is the yes of the total person. It is not simply intellectual assent. It is that, but it is more than that. It is a surrender to that. It is living in accordance with that truth. It's that total surrender. See, without that, there's no hope of deliverance. There's no hope of deliverance no matter how often we may say, this is the church of the Lord, the church of the Lord, the church of the Lord. There has to be that personal responsiveness and connection to God. Now, as God says in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, He's watching. See, we have no secrets from God. We may be, may be able to fool our fellow worshipers, but if we're living in sin, God knows it. You see, He knows it. You're not getting over on Him. You may be able to fool the people you hobnob with or the people in church, but if you're doing things living in sin, living in rebellion to God, God knows it. And that's what he says, I'm watching. And Jer God reminds them in Jeremiah 7, 12 to 14 of what he did to his sanctuary in Shiloh, the place where the Ark of the Covenant had been kept when Israel was a tribal federation. He reminds them what he did to that. That sanctuary had been destroyed, presumably by the Philistine army in 1050, after the battle that's described in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And that destruction is referred to in Psalm 78, 50, verses 56 to 64. So here's this sermon. And then let me, let me give you the reaction. Here's this sermon that is preached in the temple while these throngs are coming in. Jeremiah 26, 1 to 6 probably is a summary of the sermon that's reported in chapter 7. The emphasis in chapter 7, 1 to 15 is on the content of the sermon. But the emphasis in chapter 26, that, that shifts and it focuses on the reaction of the people to that sermon. Jeremiah 26, I'll read 1 to 11. Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen, and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law which I've set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and this city a curse among all the nations of the earth. Verse 7, the priests, the prophets, and all the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people... Everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people seized him and said, you must die. Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh and this city will be desolate and deserted? And all the people crowded around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. 
When the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went up from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their places at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, This man should be sentenced to death because he has prophesied against this city. You have heard it with your own ears. Now here we have the priests and the so-called prophets and the people wanting Jeremiah, the prophet of the Lord, dead. And the officials and the people were persuaded not to kill him. And the priests and prophets, they went along with that. But they apparently banned Jeremiah from the temple for life. And you see that in, in chapter 36, verse 5. Now the anger that these people have, where they want to kill Jeremiah. The anger that they have is not simply because Jeremiah's message threatened death or charged them with a phony piety. He did all that, but that's not what is at the root of their great anger. It's deeper than that. See, what enraged them was that he challenged their false sense of security, their false theology that God would always protect Jerusalem and thus protect them regardless of their faithlessness. That's what got him, you see. And that message will stir anger today. That same message will stir anger today. People who've made peace with their sin by constructing a theology that rationalizes away the consequences of rebellion, they don't take kindly to somebody bursting that bubble. If I have constructed this theological bubble that makes me feel comfortable in rebellion against God, and you come along and say, that doesn't work. Well, people don't like that. Stripping away their false basis of contentment, it brings an emotional crisis. It brings them to a valley of repentance where they have to choose whether they love God more than they love their sin. And people don't like that. This is radical surgery, and though it's necessary for life. Those who are facing that surgery are not always grateful for those who have exposed their need for it. And this is what you see here. They long for the peace that their delusion brought them. They long for that, and they can resent those who disrupted that peace, labeling, labeling them as negative, or labeling them as legalist, or labeling them as enemies of grace. But the call to repentance is a call to life. It is a call to life. And those who love their brothers and sisters will risk anger and resentment from them to bring them back to the safety of the Lord. And we must never forget that the God we serve is an awesome God. Awesome God who's worthy of our worship and obedience. And we must never turn the church into a den of robbers, a place where we think we can safely hide in rebellion. As Paul warned the Galatians in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. People reap what they sow. Those who sow to please their sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. Those who sow to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. There is no faith without surrender of the heart. And repentance is not something to be feared and not talked about and not... It is the way back to God. You see, if we leave people in their sin, we're not loving them. We are leaving them that way because we fear how, what they'll think about us. And we are better than that. We are called to be holy and loving of people and we have to be willing to do that. Now, you know how we end sermons here in the church. If anybody has any needs, we're here. If we can help you with anything, uh, you come, you tell us, we'll share it with the community, pray for you. Uh, if anybody's here who's ready to put on Christ, we'll discuss that. That would be a joy. But do that while we stand and sing.